Okay, so I guess uh, we'll get started. It, oh, no, it's 1.49. Uh, let's wait for a few more seconds before it becomes 1.50. Can everyone hear me fine? I hope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So it's one fifty already. So let's get started. So um, some students told me that they would like to have synchronous lecture. So I thought I'll re-record all these lectures, put it up on YouTube. Hopefully this time uh, the board will be better visible because it's all on computer. Uh, so today I'm going to just uh, start with the lecture two. Uh, and of course, if you're watching earlier videos, this is equivalent to lecture one in the in-class lectures. So we're just going to go through. So the, the roadmap is in this lecture and the next lecture, we'll go through some of the prerequisite stuff for this class. And then we'll jump directly into the heart of optimization from lecture three onwards, or perhaps even from the end of lecture two onwards. So the first uh, thing that I'm going to talk about today is norm. So this is my Rn is my Euclidean space. Um, so on Euclidean space, you have norm and you have inner product. So the inner product, of course, if you have two vectors, x, y, and r, n, the inner product is defined as x transpose y. This is the inner product. Um, and two vectors are said to be orthogonal. x is orthogonal to y. x transpose y equal to zero. So this is something you probably already remember from your linear algebra class. Uh, this is typically denoted by x is orthogonal to y. This is the notation for orthogonality. Let's talk about norm on Rn. So you have, uh, so you can define norm in any way you want. Uh, so typically the properties of the norms are, so the a norm has to satisfy three properties. So the first is positive definiteness. X must be greater than zero for all X not equal to zero and norm of x equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. So that's positive definiteness property. The second one is symmetry. So norm of x, well, let me call it scaling. So if I have alpha, which is any real number, I multiply the vector x with the scalar alpha, then the norm of alpha x is absolute value of alpha multiplied by the norm of x. And then the third property. Uh, can you all mute your microphone? Thank you. Um, so the third property is triangle inequality. norm of x plus y is less than equal to norm of x plus norm of y. So if uh, a definition of a norm satisfies these three properties, so if a definition on a vector x satisfies these three properties, then it's actually a norm on that space. And uh, there are many norms that are typically used in, um, in optimization slash um, dynamic optimization. So the common norms are L2 norm, where norm of x is square root of x transpose x. This is defined by norm of x uh, with a subscript 2. 
Uh, and this is the norm that we will commonly use throughout the course. Then there is L1 norm, which is summation i equals one to n absolute value of xi. That's the L1 norm. Then we have L infinity norm, max over all i absolute value of xi. And then we have L P norm, Okay, so this is known as the LP norm. So these are the common norms that we will be using uh, throughout this course. Sorry, I mean, so these are the norms that are typically used in optimization, but this is the one that we will commonly use uh, in this particular class. Uh, but the other norms will be used once in a while, uh, but L2 norm is what we will commonly use uh, in the class. Uh, any question so far? You can just unmute yourself and ask me the question. I'm not going to be looking at the chat window, so just uh, ask me question by unmuting yourself. I had uh, one question for point, uh, the positive definites. Yes. What's the symbol before the x does not equal zero? Oh, this is for all. Okay, let me define these symbols. So this is for all, this is there exists and what else? Yeah, I think, oh, this is if and only if. Uh, this symbol is implies. Any other symbol that I used? No. Oh, yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Great. Any other question? Okay, perfect. So next in line is the standard basis. For RN. So typically, uh, you have I'm going to use EI to denote a standard basis. So EI stands for zero at all positions and one at the ith position. Now it's easy to see that any vector X can be written as X1, E1, X2, E2, X and EN. So that's why it's called a basis vector because any vector X can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors with an appropriate coefficient uh, in front. Okay. Then you have orthonormal basis. So you have u1 to un forms an orthonormal basis for Rn if and only if ui transpose uj equals to zero for all i not equal to j 
the two norm of ui is equal to one for all i that's the first requirement and the second requirement is u1 to un be linearly independent well the first requirement will automatically satisfy the second requirement also so you have to have a linearly independent set of vectors and they must be orthogonal to each other with norm 1 so that becomes an orthonormal basis for rn Okay. The next in line is Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Which basically says absolute value of X transpose Y is less than equal to p norm of x q norm of y where 1 over p plus 1 over q adds to 1 in particular absolute value of x transpose y is upper bounded by the two norm of x multiplied by the two norm of y. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover for um, the Euclidean space and some of the important things, specifically norm, inner product, standard basis, and orthonormal basis. So these are the things we will frequently encounter um, in the course of this particular class. The next in line that we want, I want to talk about is sequences um, uh, so sequences, so, um, how should I introduce? So sequences are collection of points, infinite collection of points in Rn. And from every sequence, you can extract what is known as a subsequence, which is a subset of the original sequence, an infinite subset of the original sequence. So for instance, I can define a subsequence as x1, x100, x300, x301, x5000, and so on. Okay, so that's my, that's one subsequence. I can define another subsequence, x3, x10, x20, x55, x78, and so on. So these are all subsequences of the original sequence. Okay. Now, while you can define sequences generally, uh, we would be more interested in convergent sub convergent sequences.
so we say that x k k equals one to infinity. So this is a sequence converges to x bar if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n epsilon such that. X k minus x bar is less than epsilon for all k greater than or equal to n epsilon. Okay, so let's look at a picture. Let's say I have a sequence. So this is my R n. This is your k, and this is my x one. X two, X three, X four, X five, and so on. So we say that this particular sequence is converging to, say, X bar. If I look at the tail of the sequence, if I look at the tail of the sequence, and I see that the entire sequence is within an epsilon ball of X bar. So, what is an epsilon ball of x bar? I can draw an epsilon ball around x bar. Or rather, two epsilon in this case. So, epsilon above and epsilon below. So, I've drawn a epsilon ball around x bar, and the entire tail of the sequence is within that epsilon ball of x bar. Okay. So that's uh, uh, that's the definition of a convergent sequence. So I can make this epsilon small, and I can find the tail of the sequence such that the entire tail is contained within that epsilon ball of x bar. Okay, so for every epsilon greater than zero, I can take epsilon as small as I want. Um, I can find the tail of the sequence. Rem remember, k greater than or equal to n epsilon. So I can find the tail of the sequence. Which is within an epsilon ball around x bar. So in higher dimension, you know, so this is one way to visualize it. The other way to visualize it is, um, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is x bar meant to be like the average or or just a random? No, it's just a one point in the space. It's not an average. Thank you. So other way to visualize it is here is your x bar and you draw an epsilon ball around x bar and here is your sequence so your sequence essentially converges to x bar if you pick the epsilon ball around x bar and um the entire tail of the sequence so what's the tail of the sequence here so this would be the tail of the sequence and the entire tail of the sequence is contained within that epsilon ball epsilon ball around x bar so that's the definition of a convergent sequence and the reason why a convergent sequence arises within a, within the field of optimization is because when you run an algorithm uh, you would want that algorithm to converge and not blow up right so what is convergence means convergence means that it converges to a specific point which uh, essentially satisfies such a property and uh, if the sequence if the optimization blows up the optimization algorithm blows up it means that the sequence doesn't converge and it act and sometimes it could diverge to infinity 
So you get all these INF and NAN numbers in MATLAB. And that's because your optimization algorithm is blowing up. Okay. So we talked about convergent sequence. Uh, there is another class of sequences that would be very important in uh, this particular class, which would be Cauchy sequence. So XK is said to be a Cauchy sequence. If and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an epsilon such that an epsilon is in is a natural number such that norm of xk minus xm is less than epsilon for all km km greater than or equal to n epsilon Okay, now let's look at a picture. I have the same sequence that I had before. This is my XK. This is my K. Now, what does Cauchy sequence say? Let's pick an epsilon greater than zero and look at the tail of the entire sequence. Okay, so just pick epsilon greater than zero. Let me draw it in a different color. This is the epsilon I picked. Okay, and what it says is, if I pick any two points within the tail, so I pick, uh, let's say I pick this point and I pick this point within the tail. This is epsilon. So I pick any two points within the tail and the distance between the two points is less than epsilon. So the distance between the two points is less than epsilon for any two points in the tail of the sequence. Okay, so I, the tail of the sequence is starting from here for this particular value of epsilon. And I pick any two points, let's say I pick this point and I pick this point and I take the difference and take the norm of the difference. It's less than epsilon for, every, for any two points within the tail of the sequence. Professor, I have a question. Yes. So from the plot, is that epsilon or two epsilon? So in this case, it's epsilon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In the earlier case, it was two epsilon, but here I'm just plotting epsilon. Any other question? Cool. Okay, so let's look at a diverge, a sequence that doesn't converge. Okay, just for kicks. Okay, so this is a sequence 
And if you look at the sequence, it doesn't actually converge to anything. Um, but you will notice two things, okay? The first thing you will notice is that there exists a subsequence. So this is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Okay, so there exists a subsequence that converges. Actually, there are two subsequences here that converges. Okay, but the original sequence itself doesn't converge. Okay, the second thing is, this is a non-convergent sequence. And if you apply the, let's say you want to check whether this is a Cauchy sequence or not. So I have to draw an epsilon ball. So let's say I draw an epsilon ball right here. And I notice that um, the tail of the sequence if I pick any two points within the tail of the sequence, so within, so let's say I pick x5 and I pick x8, I pick any two points in the tail and the difference between the two is greater than epsilon. And therefore, this is not a Cauchy sequence. Not convergent and not a Cauchy sequence. Okay, so there is something mathematically deep going on here. And I want to recall that result from um, some undergraduate analysis class that you may have taken or you may not have taken, but it's, uh, it's an important result, which is every convergent sequence is a Cauchy sequence and every Cauchy sequence converges. In Rn. So this result of course holds only for Rn. So I'm not uh, and of course, in this class, we will only be concerned about Rn, so uh, only about Euclidean space. So uh, this is a result that uh, you should always remember. If you want to show that an output of an optimization algorithm will always converge, one of the ways of showing the convergence is by establishing that the output of the optimization algorithm is a Cauchy sequence. And that would automatically imply that the optimization algorithm will always converge to a solution. Professor, I have another question. Yes. So does the implication of this diagram mean that, for example, if you have a non-convergent sequence, you can extract a convergent, a convergent sequence that respects this theorem, would that That's right. then, That's right. yes, would that then imply that, are you in, in essence kind of restructuring the optimization? Would it be a different optimization then? Uh, let me get to that point in a bit. So uh, actually okay. let, me, let me just talk about it right now. So, you know, the, the, the actual theorem says uh, so another theorem says that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. Let me just write it. Every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. Okay, so your first question was, if I have a non-convergent sequence, 
can I always extract a convergent subsequence? Now the answer to that is, well, the original sequence has to be bounded. Um, now let's look at xk equals to k. Okay, and this is an unbounded sequence because you can't have a uniform bound over xk. And therefore it will not have a convergent sub subsequence. Okay, now the second part of your question was that let's say you run an optimization algorithm and you're getting say plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. So you have a, you have a, a not convergent sequence coming out of the optimization algorithm, but you can extract the convergence of sequence because the sequence itself is bounded and it's just plus one and minus one and plus one and minus one. So the bound on the sequence is just one. Um, the answer to the question would be that no, actually if your sequence is oscillating, I mean, not just oscillating, if you're not converging to a point, it's quite likely close to the optimal solution, but it's not the optimal solution. Okay, so you are doing, you get to, so let's say here is your X star, which is the optimal solution. And I haven't talked about optimality yet, but uh, since you asked the question, uh, let me just give you a brief idea. What may be happening, you start from X naught, you initialize your optimization algorithm with X naught, and then you are trying to get close to X star. And then when you get close to X star, you are essentially just oscillating around X star, but you're not really converging to X star. So even if you, let's say, pick a convergent subsequence, you will be at this point, which is not X star, and therefore it doesn't mean that um, if you extract the convergence subsequence and you look at the limit, that may not be related to X star at all. Uh, it may be close to X star, it may not be close to X star, but it's certainly not related to, it's not equal to X star. That's for sure. So one of the important uh, thing that we will study in this particular course is we are going to study, let's say, uh, 20, 25 different algorithms for solving optimization problems. And we would like to know under what conditions would those algorithms converge to the optimal solution. Um, so we're not just close to the optimal solution. We will actually eventually reach the optimal solution. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot about some of these convergent, how do you make a algorithm convergent to the optimal solution as we progress during the course. Does that answer your question? Yes, Professor. Okay. Yeah. Any other question at this time? Okay. Uh, let's move on to another topic called monotone sequence. So we say that XK is monotone sequence if x1 is less than equal to x2 is less than equal to x3 and so on. Now, what do I mean by a vector is less than equal to another vector? So we say that A is less than equal to B if AI is less than equal to BI for all I. So of course, A is A1 to AN, B is B1 to BN. Both of them are vectors in RN. Okay.
So this is called a monotone sequence. Let's look at an example. Um, so two, five, six, a, three, four, seven. And in this case, what we see is that A1 is less than or equal to B1, but A2 is greater than B2. A3 is less than B3. So because you have A2 greater than B2, I can't really say that A is less than or equal to B. I can't say that because it, you have inequality both ways uh, for every element in the vector. On the other hand, if I write A equals to 2, 5, 6, b equals to 3, 5, 7, then I can say a is less than or equal to b. Okay. So this is an ordering uh, of vectors over Rn. Any question on this definition of monotone sequence? Okay, so so far we talked about uh, convergent sequence. Now there is another cool result in analysis. A bounded monotone sequence. Converges. Okay, so if you have a monotone sequence, let's say, um, so, okay, maybe I, uh, I should mention that this is a monotone increasing sequence and you can have a monotone decreasing sequence also where X1 is greater than or equal to X2 is greater than or equal to X3 and so on and so forth. So as long as your monotone sequence is, so if you have an increasing sequence, it must be bounded from above. If you have a decreasing sequence, it must be a bounded from, it must be bounded from below. And if that is the case, then the sequence itself would converge. Okay, so XK. So if, if norm of XK is less than some value capital M, then XK converges to some X bar. assuming that XK is monotone. Okay. Any, any other question? Perfect. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is the pace okay? Are you able to write what I'm writing on the tablet or, or am I going too fast? The pace is good, Professor. Okay. Um, professor, I had a question. Yes, go ahead. So when you say a sequence is monotone, it is already bounded on one of the other ends, right? One of the uh, two ends. Uh, let me... Let's try to construct a sequence, which is not. So I have minus infinity, minus infinity, minus infinity, zero, 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 one, one, one. Okay. So it need not be bounded on both ends. Okay. But, but if you have an increasing sequence, you want it to be bounded from above in order for it to converge. If you have a decreasing sequence, so x1 less than equal to x2 less than equal to x3 less than equal to uh, and so on and all of it is less than equal to some finite value m okay so then um, this sequence would converge on the other hand if you have x1 um, greater than equal to x2 greater than equal to x3 greater than equal to something this should be greater than equal to m and this M should be greater than minus infinity. So it has to be bounded from below. In which case it will converge. 
and of course uh, I mean, so in mathematics of course you will say so i'm saying bounded sequence because i just want to be within the bounded domain i don't want to talk about all the edge cases that could happen mathematically uh and of course within the optimization um like for all the applications that you would consider in your career uh, you don't want to be dealing with infinity at all so um so as long as your algorithm is not blowing up and is converging uh, we are good to go uh, this particular result will be used in one of the assignment problems later on so make sure that you understand this result right now any any other question so one of the things that i would suggest is when you are dealing with sequences all this abstract mathematical stuff uh, try to always construct an example or a counter example in your head for any claim you want to make okay it's a very good exercise of course initially it will be difficult but as you become good at it it will help you prune out bad ideas pretty quickly uh, as and when you get it so just a very useful tool that i have found in my own uh, research career okay so next topic i want to talk about is uh, continuity and differentiability okay so a function i have a function from rn to r um is said to be continuous if and only if i'm going to give you two definitions xk converges to x bar implies fxk converges to fx bar that's one definition the second definition is for every epsilon greater than 0 there exist a delta greater than 0 such that fx minus fy is less than epsilon for every for every y such that x minus y is less than delta okay so these are two equivalent definitions of continuity if you pick a convergent sequence then the function evaluated at that at the elements of the sequence also should converge to a limit or the second is called the famous epsilon delta definition for continuity um and of course it's uh, if you have taken a course in calculus using the epsilon delta definitions you probably have constructed a lot of such epsilon delta pair for different types of functions any question on continuous functions um number 2 is not quite clear for me sorry can you say that again number 2 the condition number 2 is not yes. quite clear yes number 2 what what's the question for number 2 um we can bear on like two points of the function and we're making sure that it's less than epsilon and right what... right okay so let's look at a picture okay let's look at a picture so here is my x here is here is my fx and i pick a 
epsilon ball around fx. So this is my epsilon ball around fx. Uh, I can find a delta greater than zero. So let's say my delta is Delta looks something like this. Uh, so that if I pick any point Y within this epsilon ball, my Fy, sorry, within this delta ball, my Fy will be within this epsilon ball around Fx. Yep, that's clarified. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the usual epsilon delta definition. So you have to pick epsilon. Epsilon is a free parameter. You pick epsilon greater than zero, and then delta actually depends on epsilon. So let me just explicitly write delta epsilon because I want to make sure that I want to emphasize that delta actually depends on the choice of epsilon, it's not independent of epsilon. Okay. So continuity is one thing. Uh, differentiability is stronger than continuity. So let's say I have a function from R to R. So we say, okay, let me just write it as the usual notation del F by del X is defined as limit H goes to zero fx plus h minus fx over h. This is evaluated at x naught. Okay, so this is known as the derivative of f. And this is for a function in one dimension. Okay, so function takes as input a real number and outputs a real number. This is how you define differentiability. Now let's try and extend this notion to functions of multiple dimension. So let's say I have a function f which is mapping r into r. So I'm going to use x1 to xn, okay? So the notation for dif differentiation of f here is gradient of f evaluated at x and the derivative itself will be, so gradient of fx will be a vector in Rn. So the ith um, coordinate of this particular vector is defined as follows. Limit h goes to zero, fx plus h multiplied by ei. Remember ei is the vector with all zeros and one at the ith position. Okay, so um, that's how you define the gradient of f for a function f that takes as input a vector. So let's look at, and so let me, let me define it as del f over del xi. And so then I can write gradient of fx as Uh, the gradient of f at x is the gradient of f at x1 all the way up to the gradient of f at xn. So that's why it's a vector in Rn. If x were a row vector, this would be a row vector, but because we always treat a vector as a column vector in the optimization class, 
Uh, and in general, in EC, all vectors are considered as column vectors. So, um, so the gradient itself will be a column vector. Any questions so far? I'm going to go through a couple of examples just to make this point clear. But any questions on the definition of uh, differentiation of function of multiple variables? Okay, so let's look at an example. I have f from r2 to r, uh, fx equal to x1 log of x2. Now, if it were a blackboard, I would ask you to solve it, but uh, let's let's try to do it. See if someone can come up with an answer. So what's the first line of this derivative? You can just unmute yourself and answer. Then x2. Sorry? There is a lot of background noise. Uh, can you? Then x2. Then x2. Oh, okay. Correct. Okay. What's the second element of this vector? x1 over x2 yeah x1 over x2 perfect so the gradient of f is basically the derivative with respect to x1 as the first element and the derivative with respect to x2 treating x1 as constant as the second element okay um, I want to write some complicated function. Well, x1, x3. OK. What's the derivative now? So those who have already spoken, you don't need to speak again. Well, I would encourage you not to speak again. Someone else can you tell me what should the first element of this vector be? Ln x2 plus x3 plus x, x3. Perfect. Um, let's differentiate it with respect to x2 now. Um, anyone wants to tell me what the second element would be? x1 over x2 plus x3. OK. And that's it, right? Yes. Nothing else. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect. And what about derivative with respect to x3? x1 over x2 plus x3 plus x1. Great. So you guys know what, how to take the differentiation with respect to a vector. So that's great. Okay. So this is what the derivative, the derivative would look like for a function of uh, three variables and so on. You can extend this for concept for functions of multiple variables. Uh, it seems like I'm out of time. Uh, so in the next class, we are going to do the following things. We will talk about mean value theorem. And we will talk about Taylor series expansions. So we will build upon this uh, idea of first derivative. So we'll talk about the second derivative of function. Then we'll talk about mean value theorem, Taylor series. And then we'll talk about matrices and determinants. No, matrices and eigenvalues. So that's what we will talk about in the next class. So these are all the prerequisites. And once we go through all this stuff, we are, we'll be done with all the prerequisites for this course. And we'll jump directly into the theory of optimization and gradient descent algorithm. Um, so after this, I have my office hours. Um, I'm just going to keep the Zoom open. Well, actually, I need to close it to record the video. And then I can reopen the Zoom link in like 10, 15 minutes. 
so uh, if you want to if you have any questions on assignment quiz whatever any other thing any other administrative issues or even project uh, just stay back and i'll be back in like 10 15 minutes after i have recorded the video okay um, so thank you and i'll see you guys on monday at 150 pm eastern time thank you professor yeah thank you thank you thank you